morning, Edwin. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I'm so glad you're all here this morning. Uh, and we're all here together to worship the Lord, and, and uh, we have such a wonderful, um, a wonderful treat this morning that the kids are going to lead us in the, the uh, singing to the Lord. And I think it's the first time in eight years that someone other than us has, has and I love it. It's fantastic. You're going to um, lose your job. Yeah, I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. And um, but no, I'm so thankful that uh, that they're willing to uh, learn and to lead us in song uh, for the Lord. I'm so thankful that Sandy is teaching them and, and helping them. And, and um, so just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, you know about the offering box. Uh, we don't pass a plate around, so the offering box is near the door here. Bible study Wednesday 6 p.m. We're continuing our study of the book of Acts and, and so I encourage you to come. It's a wonderful time of fellowship and studying the word uh, the Lord together. And so really encourage you to come. Wonderful time. Uh, we're going to go soul winning after the worship service. Now this morning we're going to have uh, our meal uh, uh, that we have for the first Sunday of every month and then we're going to go knock on some doors afterwards. Uh, we're going to have communion next week uh, for practical reasons. Uh, we just don't have the room this week uh, to, uh, to have. So next week we will. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, uh, there's no biblical mandate that we have communion <laughs> once a month. You know, uh, just whenever we do it, we're to remember the Lord, right? Uh, and a sacrifice and all. But uh, we're going to do it next week. Uh, Vacation Bible School, July 15th to 18th. Uh, 5.30 to 8 uh, p.m. each day, four days, and uh, we have the scripture and all. Uh, if you're teaching, um, uh, make sure that uh, uh, you get from me today the, um, the outline of uh, the days and the, you know, the, the scripture that go along with it. Okay? All right, so let's stand and sing the Lord's praises. for um, our church family so grateful for these kids who um, have taken the time to to learn uh, to help to lead us to sing uh, our praises unto you Lord and and father as always we pray that uh, we want this service every second of it to be pleasing to you uh, uh, and so please uh, guide us so that it will be in our Lord Jesus name we pray amen, amen. amen. Okay, please be seated Okay, now Jess will lead us in a couple of uh, hymns.
Bless you.
Yes, let's pray for Virgil. Uh, uh, he's, uh, I went with him to the doctor on Thursday, you know, concerning his memory. He was talking about his, his eyesight, losing his and all. And it turns out that uh, the heart monitor showed that he's has a, having a problem with his heart, a ventricular tachycardia, and, and uh, it's not a good thing. And so he's going to have some more testing done and all that. Uh, but that's, uh, the doctor thinks that's explaining why he's having these, these what's going on in his head, primarily, you know, that, particularly with his vision. So let's please pray for, for Virgil. He messaged me this morning, said that he wasn't feeling well. So. All right, what else? Peggy. Uh, my sister-in-law got to bring other twin home yesterday, and Mercedes had her baby. Yes, yes. Uh, so your sister-in-law, you said? Okay. Yes. She wasn't uh, able to bring both of the twins home at the same time, so yeah, the little right. girl ended up having to stay a couple extra weeks. But yesterday, she finally got to bring me. Oh, praise God, huh? Yeah, so let's pray for, pray for them. And also, uh, Mercedes and John and Oa uh, gave birth to a baby girl. Uh, and uh, Catalina, right? Six, nine. Yeah, six pounds, nine ounces. And Catalina K. K is her name, yeah. We went to see her at the, they're back home now. And uh, uh, everyone's doing well, praise the Lord. And so thankful for that. Yes. What else? Jim. Continue prayer for my friend Paul Molson. Yeah. And also my cousin Tom Lemel was in an automobile accident out in Indiana. Oh. And there's broken bones and all other than that. I have any uh, more specific. Okay, so let's uh, continue to pray for Paul. You said that he's going through uh, more chemotherapy, right? And, and all because of this cancer. And then let's pray for uh, for Jim's cousin Tom. Uh, Anything else? Yes, Samantha. Uh, Tom goes tomorrow for his yearly heart appointment. Oh, so okay. we're just praying for good. Yes. Good news. So Dominic, uh, so uh, yeah, our chicken. Oh, for yeah. Cody, yes, yeah, yeah. Welcome, Thanks Cody. Welcome, Cody. <laughs> yes, Cody, and that's also uh, Bill's been coming as well. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've met uh, Bill yet, but uh, please do. Everybody. Yeah, we met down uh, down uh, in your neighborhood, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, knocking on doors, and uh, so thankful for that. Well, welcome to everyone who's, who's visiting today as well. Um, and anyone, anyone else? I'm just. I'm so thankful to be here. So yes, it's yes. only been two weeks. I don't know. I don't know if you saw the look on my face when I saw you coming. <laughs> oh, she's here! Yeah, <laughs> this is good. thank God. Yeah, <laughs> praise God. So let's uh, continue to pray for Kathy Upward um, for her healing. With uh, what a difference between this time and the last time. Yes. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Pray for, <coughs> pray for Carol's kids. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. Pray for Carol. Thank you, Mel. Carol and her children. Thank you. They need it. So do I. Yes. Oh, yes. My Carol. brother has a blood clot in his heart. Your brother has a blood clot in his yeah, heart? in the atrium. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. His name's Edward. Edward. So, Edward, Maryland's. He went in to get the watchman done, but um, they, they found that, so they can't do it until they get. And if they go in to get the clot, they said they might bust it up and have a bad stroke. Yeah, yeah, go to his brain, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so okay, uh, the blood thinner will take care of it. Yeah, let's pray that it works. So let's pray for Edward, Marilyn's uh, brother. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray then. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we pray that your name always uh, be hallowed. Um, Father, I'm so grateful for our church family. I'm grateful for um, our, our children. I'm grateful for um, everyone who um, does so much to, um, um, to serve the Lord in, in various capacities in our church family. Um, we... Um, 
we know, Lord, that you, you've heard the needs, the physical needs, uh, the, uh, the healings that people are, are seeking, and, and as well as the emotional problems, um, you know, uh, maybe addictions and all. Father, we ask you that if it be your will that you heal all those who are having difficulty with their health, uh, that you comfort those who are um, suffering uh, emotionally, um, all to your glory. And, and as always, Father, we ask that um, you use these situations to show people their need for salvation and that there's only one way to you, and that is by believing on your Son. Now, Father, um, we um, are so thankful for these children and, and the junior church teachers who teach them every week. We ask you to guide the junior church teachers to, to teach the children correctly and and Father, please help these children to be attentive and to, to learn and well-behaved. And Father, please fill me with your spirit so that only your truth, the only truth that there is, comes out of my mouth. And Father, we want to live by these truths, so please write them on our hearts so that we will. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Junior Church. Are you sure that this is working? Oh, you're getting a Bible. That's okay. Good job. Okay, does everyone have uh, a bulletin? Everyone have a Bible? You're going to need, uh, we're going to turn to somewhere. Well, actually, a couple of places in the Bible today, so I encourage you to have one if you don't have one. I can keep one of those, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody got one? All right, anyone else need, need a Bible? <laughs> so. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you. Uh -huh. We are continuing our sermon series on the, the uh, book of John. And the title of the the title of the sermon this morning is "Make Straight the Way of the Lord." Make straight the way of the Lord. You know there are so many ways that are available today. You know what? Excuse me one second. I'm going to turn this board off because I keep hearing myself in an echo. <laughs> the mic is picking me up, and we'll make sure we turn it back on. All right, like I said, there's so many more ways available today than in the past for Satan and his minions to try to deceive people. You know, when you agree? <clears throat> to try to fool people into believing wrong things. One such way is the endless supply of modern versions, so to speak, of the Bible that distort God's Word in so many ways. But people will say, oh, but it's easier to read. People will say, well, first of all, it's not easy to read. Secondly, it's a huge lie that they're just like, for example, the King James Bible, just easier to read. Not even the New King James is that way. What is different is not the same. And the modern versions, unfortunately, distort God's word and produce false doctrine. I don't know if you all saw um, on the, uh, I posted a documentary on the preserved word uh, on our prayer page. I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, because, for example, you know what the New King James says about salvation? It says that it's difficult. Is salvation difficult? No! It's easy! It's a free gift! And then there's the problem of the study Bible. You know, people want to learn, right? And so they think, well, I think I'll get a, stu a study Bible. At the top of the list of the worst study Bibles, as far as I'm concerned, is the Schofield study Bible that has in the margins all sorts of false doctrine. Then you have a, a, the, the issue of, I remember when we were out in Bergenstown, uh, we would have Bible study, and people would make comments like, well, my Bible says this. 
Well, their Bible didn't say that. It was the notes in the margins that said that. But do you see how people confuse the Bible with what's in the margin notes? So they think it's like their Bible saying this. It's not. It's some guy saying this. Okay. And so if there's one thing that I've preached over and over again is the importance of us reading God's actual word, reading it, studying it every day. Not the sermon notes. I mean, uh, the sermon notes can't. Uh, not, not, not the notes in the margins is what I meant to say. But not even the sermon notes. That's just a, a synopsis of what was preached. It's God's word that you have to focus on. It's God's word that I have to focus on. And if there's something in the sermon notes that contradicts God's word, then scratch it. Right? So if we don't focus on God's word, we're going to fall for anything. You know, we'll fall for whatever people try to lay on us. You know, it's especially smooth-talking theologians. Okay? You know, with impressive degrees and titles and all of that. Okay? Now you might wonder why it might... Because we're going to see this in the scripture today. How you know, people in the world have attempted to twist things around. Okay? So, John chapter 1... Please turn to John chapter 1 if you're not already there. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. And that is with verse 14. Okay, verse 14. All right, everyone there? John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Bible reads, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now I have now I have more to say about this in a moment. But though there are those who will tell you that the word, and by the way, who is the word? Jesus. Jesus, right? The word is referring to Jesus. And notice that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, talking about Jesus. But there are those who will tell you that the reason Jesus came to earth in bodily form and etc. is because Jesus is a spirit, and you wouldn't be able to see him unless he was in body form, and all that sort of thing, right? But in reality, Jesus came to the earth in human form because a person, a human being, a man, had to die for our sins, had to pay the price for our sins, right? A human being, a man, a person, had with flesh, just like we have, had to live a, had to be like that spotless lamb, had to live a perfect, sinless life to be able to pay for our sins, otherwise he would have been paying for his own. And only God in the flesh could live a perfect, sinless life. Only Jesus could do that. And so I put this in your bulletin as well, your, your sermon on Jesus is full of grace and truth. Everything that Jesus says is true, Anything that contradicts what Jesus says is false. Period. End of story. That's it. And as a matter of fact, we know that the famous passage, Sandy wrote a song about this that, Lord willing, when we get to that, we will, we will um, lead you all in. And that is John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So that's why I put this in your notes as well. So notice something. It's not just that the Lord Jesus speaks the truth. Notice what it says. He is the truth. He's the embodiment of the truth. And one truth that we know is that entrance into heaven requires perfect righteousness, right? It doesn't require pretty good righteousness. It doesn't require, oh, um, you know, you've done some pretty good things righteousness. There's only one way to obtain perfect righteousness, and that is to have the Lord Jesus' righteousness applied to you. Applied to me. And the only way you have Jesus' righteousness applied to us is if we put all of our trust in Jesus 
and his paying the price for our sins, and no trust in ourselves to work our way into heaven in any way. Amen? Amen. That's the only way. That's the only way. And so, that's the truth. And Jesus, our Lord Jesus, died graciously for us. He graciously paid the price for us. And notice what I put in your sermon notes. Grace is receiving something that we do not re uh, deserve, right? It's receiving something that we do not deserve. And let me tell you, folks, we do not deserve salvation. We cannot earn salvation. And as I put it, it is a free gift extended to us by the Lord's grace, and we accept it by trusting Jesus. I remember I, I actually, uh, someone who was trying to confront me about not using the King James one time, and I pointed out, well, you know, your King James tells, New King James, I mean, your New King James tells you that salvation is difficult. This, this guy tried to draw me this map of how it's different. What are you talking about? Salvation, God knew that if it were difficult, we'd mess it up, right? <laughs> it's easy. All we have to do is trust the Lord Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Right? Trust His payment for our sins. Realize we can't work our way into heaven. There's nothing we can do to ever deserve going to heaven. It's by grace through faith we are saved. Not of ourselves. Right? And so He graciously died. This is a gift that is given to us. And as, as Aldo preached on many times, uh, if you have to do something to get a gift, is it a gift? No. So we emphasize it's a free gift. The Bible calls it a free gift. But you have to accept it. And how do you accept it? By faith. Right? So notice what it says, Jesus, full of grace and truth. Look at verse 15 now. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh Notice this now. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Okay? So notice what it's saying here. This is John the Baptist saying that the Lord Jesus was before John the Baptist was. Now, you might say, well, what's the big deal about that? Um, you know that John the Baptist was born physically of his mother three months before the Lord Jesus was. Right? So how can that be that the Lord Jesus was before John the Baptist was? Well, obviously it's because how did John chapter 1 begin? In the beginning was the Word. It's because Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, has always been, always was, always will be. Right? Always is, always will be. We need to make sure that people understand that the, because there's a lot of false teaching on this. I grew up, you know, thinking that the Lord Jesus did not exist until he was born of Mary, which is wrong. Right? It's just flat out wrong. The Lord Jesus has always been always is, always will be. So he pre-existed. He is eternal because he is God. You know, he's a part of the Godhead, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. He's always been, he's always will be. These three are one. Now, someday in the near future, maybe, you will hear a knock on your door and you'll look out your window and you'll see a couple of nicely dressed guys uh, with their ties, uh, you know, um, uh, wanting to speak with you with their little pamphlets. And uh, you know who they are? Jehovah's Witness, right? Yeah. And what they will try to tell you, these Jehovah's Witnesses, if you, if you give them the chance to, they will try to tell you that um, the Lord Jesus was created by God the Father. 
that he was created, he didn't always exist, that he was created by God the Father, and actually, who he actually was before he became the, the embodiment of Jesus Christ, was the archangel Michael. That's what they will try to tell you. Because the angels were created, right? So they will tell you, actually he's the archangel Michael, and um, as a matter of fact, if you, if you um, have nothing better to do and you want to visit jw.org, that's Jehovah's Witness.org, they say this on their website. So, meaning therefore, we do not worship Jesus as we do not believe that he is Almighty God. So, for anyone who thinks the Jehovah's Witness are in any way Christian, that ought to put that to bed, huh? Uh, no way are they. Look what Revelation 1.8 says. This, this is the Lord Jesus this is referring to. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Alright? Now, please turn, keep your place where you are and turn to John chapter 8, if you would which in a few weeks, Lord willing, we'll, we'll come to that as well. <clears throat> and uh, please jump down to verse 41. Okay, so now, the, um, the Pharisees are trying to trap the Lord Jesus, you know, trying to trip him up, and of course, you know, uh, how are you going to trip up God, right? And so, beginning with verse 41, the Lord Jesus responds to them and says, Ye do the deeds of your Father. Then say that to, to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one Father, even God. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So if you're ever quizzed who's the father of lies, what do you say? Devil. Satan, right? The devil. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth, convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Isn't that what we were talking about last week? You know, if you're not saved, you, you can't, you know, it'll sound like foolishness to you. Verse 48, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil? Jesus answered, I am not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye disobey, ye dishonor me, I'm sorry. Ye do not dishonor me. And I seek not mine own glory, there is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou, art, thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead, who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced, now notice what does it say, say here? This is the Lord Jesus talking to them, right? He's saying this. 
Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Because remember, Abraham had died a long time ago, right? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And why did they pick up their stones and try to kill him? Because they realized that he was calling himself God. And there's a good reason for that. Because he is. Because he is. And there are many other verses that tell us that the Lord Jesus always is, always was, always will be. So he is co-eternal with the Father and with the Holy Ghost. So it's usually the case that when those people who, uh, those people who think that the Lord Jesus was created also usually do not believe uh, in the Trinity, for example. You know, in the Godhead. They usually don't believe that. Um, they usually also don't believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. They usually don't believe that. Either. So I have a question for you then. How can anyone who is wrong about who Jesus is, how can they be a Christian? How can they believe on the Lord Jesus if they don't even know who he is? If they're wrong about who he is, right? How can they be saved if they don't understand who he is? So if anyone tries to tell you, you know, you get a knock on the door or whatever, and uh, you come across someone who says, uh, have you heard about Jesus? Oh, yeah, I sure have. Uh, let me tell you about Jesus. Okay, what do you want to tell me? Uh, who do you think Jesus is, is what we ought to ask them. Who do you think he is? If they do not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, if they do not believe that Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, is the Son of God, if they do not believe that Jesus is just as much God as God the Father and, and God the Spirit, yeah, because there are some who think he's a lesser God, right? If they don't believe that our Lord Jesus has always been, always is, always will be, then they don't know who Jesus is. See, they're, they're worshiping some other Jesus that doesn't exist. Amen? Amen? All right, so verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay, so I put this in your sermon notes. The law could never save us. It's just the opposite. The law condemns. The purpose of the law is to show us how sinful we are. The purpose of the law, if we're really paying attention, is to show us how incredibly hopeless we are without Jesus in terms of salvation. That we could never keep the law perfectly, that it's an impossibility, that we could never have perfect righteousness, that's an impossibility. So the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation came by Jesus. Okay? Verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now notice it says, no man hath seen God at any time. Theologians, you know, these guys that are held up in high regard, and you know, you ought to listen to what he says, because, you know, he, he has this degree, have come up with all sorts of incorrect doctrine. Not only about this, but about a lot of things. And why? You know, because they will mix philosophy in with their doctrine, you know? They will mix um, science and pseudoscience in with their doctrine. And what's the main reason for this? They want to appear intelligent. They want to appear smart. They, they love to be in a position 
where they have some special knowledge of the Bible that you could not have unless you turned to them. You see? We know something you don't. And you couldn't know this unless we told you. And I say, yeah, there's a reason for that because you made it up. That's why. And one of the doctrines that these egghead theologians come up with sometimes is that God has no appearance. That God the Father has no image. That God the Father has no form. You know, there are volumes written on how God has no form. Now, here are some problems with that. The Bible says that no man shall see God's face and live. Right? Now, how can that be if God doesn't have a face? How can that be? And, and theologians will say, oh, well, that's just figurative. Well, look, there has to be something that if we look at, we won't exist any longer. Right? And what does the Bible call that? His face. Look at John chapter 5. Verse 36 and 37 on the screen here. The Bible says, But I have greater witness than that of John. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. <coughs> and the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his, what's the last word? Shame. Shame. Now why would the Lord Jesus say you haven't seen his shape if he didn't have shape? Right? So another problem with this is that the Lord Jesus says, look, you haven't seen him, but I have. You haven't seen his shape, but I have. Then we have John 6, 46. Not that any man hath seen the Father, which he, save he which is of God. And who is that of God? The Lord Jesus, right? He hath seen the Father. So he's saying, look, you haven't seen the Father, but I have. Now, I am not saying that God the Father or the Holy Spirit have a physical body. Okay? I'm not, the Lord Jesus does. But I'm not saying that they have a physical body. That's not what I'm saying here. But if God the Father has no image, then who is the Lord Jesus Christ sitting next to in heaven? <laughs> right? I, I don't understand. You know, the, the, the theologians will just say, oh, well, that's just figurative. Uh, that's just a metaphor. Well, that's funny because when Stephen was being stoned, you know, and the heavens opened and he looked up, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of whom? The Father. Not a metaphor, right? He didn't see him standing next to something figurative. He saw him standing next to the Father. See my point? So there must be... God must be recognizable, must have form, and all that. Otherwise, Stephen, and see, here's the thing. People who are, uh, like, have you heard of, like, oneness Pentecostals? You know, for example, who believe that, uh, or who believe in modalism, that there really isn't the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Uh, they, it's just God... Um, uh, take, taking turns, sometimes he's the Father, sometimes he's the Son, sometimes he's the Holy Ghost. Well, if that's the case, I don't know who Jesus was praying to in the garden. You know, he, he did some very rapid transitioning, right? Uh, hey, Father, then he comes over, yes, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, back and forth. Huh? What? That makes no sense. Because it's not true. And then how can Jesus be the express image of God's person if God doesn't have an image? I don't understand. As a matter of fact, I put this in your bulletin. In Revelation chapter 22, after the last enemy is destroyed, after death is destroyed, 
after death ceases to exist, after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, we will see his face. As a matter of fact, let's put it up on the screen so you, so you can see why we're saying this. <coughs> Revelation 22, verse 1 through 4. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus, right? And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb, and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now look at the next verse. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. So what is the Bible telling us? One day we will see, as believers now, right? Believers will see the face of God and live. We have seen the face, uh, uh, you know, I mean, people have seen the face of the Lord Jesus. We'll see the face of God the Father and live, right? All right, so back to this morning's scripture, then verse 19. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias or Elijah? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? Now, what does he mean by, what do they mean by that prophet? In Deuteronomy, there's a um, prophecy of a prophet coming in the likeness of Moses and so forth. And that's a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Right? And he's saying, no, I'm not that prophet because I'm not Jesus. I'm not uh, the Lord Jesus. And so look at what it says. And he answered, no. And then verse 22. Then said they unto him, who art thou? that we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Bethabarba beyond Jordan where John was baptized. baptized. So the question is asked of him, well, okay, so if you're not that prophet, are you Elias? You know, now they, now see, here's the thing. They knew that Elias or Elijah would come before Jesus, right? How did they know this? Although, you know, the, the timing is a little different. <laughs> In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay? But then, so he's saying, no, I'm not him. John the Baptist is saying this, right? But then, you might remember from our study of Matthew 17, this happens. Verse 10, And his disciples, the Lord Jesus' disciples, asked him, saying, When... Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? Must first come. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. What ended up happening to John the Baptist? Yeah, he lost his head, right? Yeah. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Okay. 
All right, so he's saying, I'm not Elijah. I'm not Elias, right? I'm not him. But the Lord Jesus is saying, that's him. So you might wonder, well, what gives? You know, what's up with that, as the kids say, right? So I put this in your sermon notes. So here's the question. If later on, Jesus is going to explicitly say that John the Baptist is Elias, which was for to come. Why does John the Baptist deny being Elijah or Elias? And I put there a couple of possible reasons or explanations. One possible reason is just that when, when he is asked, are you Elijah? He is saying that he's not literally Elijah. And then when Jesus is saying that he's Elijah, he's really saying that he's in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, why do you say this? Because look what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and, to, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay? So that's one explanation. Is that what they, what they meant was that he's, he's in the power and spirit of Elijah. Okay? And then I put in your bulletin another explanation is that John the Baptist just doesn't realize he's Elijah. Because he they're asking a human being. You see? So that's another possible explanation. Because look, everything the Bible says is true. Amen? Every word of it is true. So is it a fact? That John the Baptist was asked if he was Elias or Elijah. Yes. Is it a fact that um, uh, he said no? Yes. Now the fact that he said no does not mean he was correct in saying no. Right? He's a guy. He could have been wrong. So what he said could have been right. What he said could have been wrong. He's a guy. But people will say, well, you see, that's proof that there's a contradiction there. Between no. It's recording what he said. What did he say? No, I'm not. He could have been wrong. He could have been Elijah and not realized that he was Elijah. It, you know, um, <coughs> because John the Baptist is not infallible. He's just a human being. So those are two possible explanations. And I think they're both... Um, viable explanations but they're put they're trying to put them in a category we want to know who you are we need to fit you in the category because the Pharisees want to know and so you're saying you're not that prophet you're saying you're not uh, the Messiah you're saying you're not Elias or Elijah well then just who are you right and why do we want to know because you seem you seem pretty <laughs> significant Right? Come on. You seem pretty significant to me. You know, you seem to have gotten people's attention, so they want to know who you are. Right? Now, of course, this question is misguided because the answer is that he's Elijah. And how do we know that? Because the Lord Jesus said, but whether he's actually Elijah or in the spirit of, you know, that. That, I'm not sure. There are two possible explanations. But the bottom line is, is he got the job done. Okay? Because look what he says. He says, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. It's what he did. So that was his job, to go before Christ to prepare a way for him. Meaning to start sowing the seeds, right? Uh, meaning to soften people up. Meaning to get the people of Israel ready so that the Lord Jesus' uh, ministry would be as successful as, as possible, as effective as possible. And so notice what he says there. I baptize with water, but he who's coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes, you know, the latch of his shoes, I'm not worthy to unloose. And then, of course, you know, Jesus shows up and says, hey, he's the one. <coughs> he's the one. <coughs> But notice what it says. I'm not worthy to unla unlatch. You know, 
at least uh, on his, his shoes, on his sandals, right? The, the shoes that he wore. And so, look, what, what is John the Baptist saying? I'm just the servant. He's God. I'm not. You see? You know, John the Baptist did not have a low self-esteem problem. You know? He does not have an inferiority complex. He simply understands the enormous, huge difference between being God and being a believer of God. You see? So, believing on the Lord Jesus means we're a child of God, you know, and all that. But let me tell you, uh, when, when we're all with the Lord, we're not going to be worshiping each other. Right? Right? We're all going to be worshiping the Lord. You see? Because He's the one that's deserving of our worship. Not us. So you don't have to have an inferiority complex. You don't have to have low self-esteem to say, He's God and I'm not. All right, so what have we learned so far from chapter 1? Well, some key teachings, right? For sure. That our Lord Jesus Christ came to this world. He came to this world to give everyone the opportunity to be saved. That's the goal. That's the plan. Not for some people to be saved, but he wants everyone to be saved. Now, he doesn't dictate everyone to be saved. Otherwise, everyone would be. But he gave everyone the opportunity. We also have learned so far that our Lord Jesus is God as well as being the Son of God, right? Uh, uh, he's part of the Godhead. You have the Father, the Son, or the Word, right? And the Holy Ghost. That our Lord Jesus is the express image of God's person. Okay. What did he say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Also, that our Lord Jesus Christ is the true light. Remember, we spent a lot of time talking about that last week. He's the true light. And he, that light shines, remember it says, on every man, on every person. And even though that light shines on every person, on everybody, it will not do anybody any good if a saved person doesn't go to them with the gospel to to share the gospel with them right that light makes you want to know you know about you know there, there's something something I, I need to hear about God but if they try to open up the Bible themselves and try to read it it'll be gibberish to them it'll be foolishness until someone with the Holy Ghost in them, comes to them and shares the gospel with them. <coughs> then once they have that same Holy Ghost in them, now they can start to understand, right? So, you know, the thing is, when I think about that light, you know, it reminds me of the fact that when we go out knocking on doors, which yeah, I think maybe the weather would be okay for us to after we're done eating. When we go knocking on doors, yeah, this is what we tend to do is we'll go down and, okay, where did we leave off? Okay, on this street. So, all right, let's go down. Now, now where do we go? And it seems like a random thing. You know, a lot of times it just seems like, oh, well, well, let's just pick this street. And sometimes I'm not so sure it's, it's all that random. Because sometimes... <laughs> Someone was exposed to, a, to the light, you know, that is wanting to know more, and God is sending us their way. You see? But if we didn't go their way, or, or any other believers go their way, what happens? What happens? So yet, God knows that there's this receptive soul there, and we even pray for it, don't we? You know, God send us to the people who want to hear the gospel. And you know, we also realize that we might be stepping into other people's, other people's labors, right? That someone else might have already started sharing the gospel with them, but they're, uh, 
but they heard it. Maybe they thought about it. And now we're coming along and watering. Or maybe someone else already watered. Yeah. And, now we're, and now God provides the increase. But the fact is, if we don't go, that seed's going to wither away and die. You know, where would we be if John the Baptist hadn't responded to the call to make straight the way? Hmm? Where would we be if someone hadn't shared the gospel with us? I can tell you where we wouldn't be here. Right? Wouldn't be here. Who knows what we would be doing? But we would also, whether we knew it or not, be preparing our way to, to go to hell. Because we were already headed there, right? We were as good as there, really. Just had to die, you know, and that's it. So, so, so such valuable lessons. Um, so let's, uh, we will continue with our, our study. But, you know, none of this matters, and all of it is gibberish if you're not saved. So if there's anyone here that does not know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. And what I mean by knowing for sure is that, you know, you realizing that salvation has absolutely nothing to do with you and everything to do with what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. Most often, if you ask someone, do you know for sure when you die, you're going to heaven, if they, if they say no, it's usually because they think salvation has something to do with themselves. You know, somehow I'm not good enough yet. Somehow I'm still, you know, I'm still doing this or that, and so that disqualifies me. Right. They think they have to give up sins to be saved. And then on the other side, but you can never, you can't do that enough. That's the point. It's already too late for that. We cannot save ourselves. You know, only accepting the Lord's free gift of salvation, trusting what He did on the cross as payment for our sins, will do that. Will save us. But then you have the other end that says, oh yeah, I know for sure I'm going to heaven because I'm not Hitler. You know, because I'm a good person. Well, you realize, until you're saved, you cannot even do anything that is good in God's eyes. Right? Anyhow, so how can you be a good person if you're not saved? You see, you're good by society standards. Oh, look at that nice thing she's doing. Right? So, so if, if you don't know for sure that when you die you want to have please see me after the service. I, I'd be glad to, to show you how you can know for sure. Amen? Amen. Right. Well, let's pray and then the kids will lead us in our last song. Father, so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for uh, uh, the uh, uh, for John, the, the Gospel of John, and and Father, we ask you to uh, sink those truths that you taught us this morning uh, into our hearts, into our minds. Help us to live by them, Lord, and to teach them to others. And uh, indeed, Lord, help us as a church, um, as individuals, to share the gospel and help people to be saved. Um, we know that uh, uh, you, you designed it so that saved people go out and share the gospel. We're the agents through which uh, your word is shared and explained and people get saved. And so, Father, help us to do that. Help us to, uh, to care about the lost uh, and uh, to help them to be saved. Um, and um, I praise you for our church family. and and all that you've done for us, and, and all that you uh, are planning to do for us. In our Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Oh, let me turn the back on so we can hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Russ. Five chairs. Oh.
Oh yeah, we need the flat chair. One moment, please, as we get them ready. He'll get. He'll get him. He'll get him. Yeah, we'll get him. So we need so someone using that stool. I'll use the stool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If our junior worship band may uh, come to the front, please. We're missing two. There they are. There she is. All right. Sing along with us, okay? Yeah, maybe we could just stay seated so that uh, you can. Okay, ready? Amen. Amen. Please stick around for lunch. Mm -hmm.